session, we'll be talking about the Unit 7 in the course MGPE 14, in which we'll be talking about Gandhi's views on the conservation of natural resources. My name is Dr. Shibhangi Vaidya from the School of Interdisciplinary and Transdisciplinary Studies, IGNO. The aims and objectives of this lecture are basically to understand Gandhi's views on conservation, to discuss some of the important practices followed in his ashrams, both in the Tolstoy ashram in South Africa as well as his several other ashrams within India. These practices basically were helpful towards sustainability and towards conservation of nature. And we'll also be discussing the impact and influence of Gandhi's ideas on some critical thinkers. I'm just going to share some important quotes. Gandhi famously said that the economic imperialism of a single tiny island kingdom, he meant of course the United Kingdom, is today keeping the world in chains. If an entire nation of 300 million, this was the population of India at the time, took to similar economic exploitation, it would strip the world bare like locusts. So I think that this particular statement of Gandhi has got immense relevance. What Gandhi was trying to imply was that if India, if independent India, adopted the same path of industrial growth or adopted the same path of economic development as the Western world, we would very soon completely destroy nature. And I think this is something very, very important to bear in mind. This particular perception, this particular understanding of Gandhi, we find reflected years later in the Earth Charter. And the quote that we would like to share here is, we stand at a critical moment in Earth's history, a time when humanity must choose its future. The choice is ours, from a global partnership to care for Earth and for one another, or risk the destruction of ourselves and the diversity of life. Fundamental changes are needed in our values, institutions and ways of living. We must realize that when basic needs have been met, human development is primarily about being more not having more. Something that was reflected in the Earth Charter is in fact something that had been discussed and practiced by Gandhi years earlier. And this is where we must emphasize the visionary and the very, very far-sighted environmental thinking of Mahatma Gandhi. And we're going to talk a little bit about it in the lecture. Before we do so, let's have a quick look at our tradition. Where do we come from? And here it would be worthwhile to look at ancient India's views on environment and conservation very briefly. So, respect for nature, all forms of life and harmonious coexistence has been a cornerstone of our civilization. Now, as you must be experiencing in your lives as well, daily life and activities, festivals and rituals have traditionally been governed by the seasons and by planetary cycles. It is important that the trees and medicinal plants were always given a great deal of importance and they were always grown alongside houses. Unfortunately, we find that in our urban cityscapes, this practice of growing trees, of growing important medicinal plants is rapidly dwindling because of the value of real estate, about the way in which people want to construct more and more concrete structures at the expense and cost of nature. Panchavati is a very beautiful concept that we have inherited. This basically refers to the planting of five varieties of trees to ensure biodiversity and profuse foliage wherever we live. And the practice of tending and revering or worshipping trees basically reflects the way in which we return our debt to nature. All these are some extremely beautiful civilizational practices that speak of the traditional commitment towards conservation, towards biodiversity and towards the reverence of nature, which is something that Gandhi really took to heart 
and developed in his own thought. After reading a very famous book by the author Adolf Just called Return to Nature, Gandhi was convinced that he should share his life not only with human beings but also with animals, birds, plants and trees in the environment. He tried to return or give back to nature what he took from nature and also led a life of voluntary simplicity so as to restrict how much he took from nature. And this is a value that he preached to all, basically a value of not exploiting nature, of returning to nature, of adopting a life of voluntary simplicity, not simplicity that is based on some kind of you know, uh, existential necessity, as much as a voluntary grasping of the need to conserve nature, of the need to respect nature and give back to it. And to quote him, I venture to suggest that it is the fundamental law of nature without exception, that nature produces enough for our wants from day to day. And if only everybody took enough for himself and nothing more, there would be no man dying of starvation in this world. Gandhi's famous aphorism, which has become a cornerstone of many environmental movements, that we must consume enough to fulfill our needs, but not for our greeds, is something that is a very, very simple idea, but an extremely profound one too. So this kind of rejection of the greed that has become a kind of a cornerstone of civilization which is dominated by the Western need or the Western driven need to conquer nature is something that Gandhi resisted, something that Gandhi challenged and questioned much, much before environmentalism as a movement became popular all over the world. How did Gandhi actualize this philosophy? So it would be helpful to take a look at what life was like in Gandhi's ashrams. So as you know, Tolstoy Farm in South Africa was one of Gandhi's first experiments with communal living with his group of satyagrahis, where they shaped a life that was based upon dignity of labor, sustainability, and minimization of wants. Now the satyagrahis over there constructed their cottages by themselves. They did not hire any labor. They believed, and Gandhi basically promoted this idea of human labor, of working with one's hands, as being an act of extreme dignity. And therefore, the construction of the cottages was done by the satyagrahis themselves, with the help of bricks and corrugated iron sheets. It's also interesting that whenever they went to Johannesburg, which was the nearest city that was 21 miles away, they would inevitably take this journey on foot. They did not hire any carriage, they did not hire any mode of transport, and they carried along homemade food. So their entire journey was something that promoted good health because they were going by foot and also minimized wastage and wanton consumption by eating food that was cooked outside. So they would carry their food along. So this may sound like something very, very simple and elemental, but how different is it from the kind of lifestyle that increasingly we find ourselves leading in the contemporary world? Let's look at some of the important sustainable practices that were practiced in Gandhi's ashrams. Let's talk about sanitation and waste disposal. This is something which is a very, very omnipresent problem in contemporary societies. We see our cities where waste, where disposal of waste has become such a huge crisis. So in the Gandhi ashrams, refuse or garbage was buried in deep trenches that were dug specifically for the purpose. And night soil also was buried in deep pits and converted into manure. Recycling was a watchword. Water, for instance, was used very, very sparingly with great economy. And the waste water was collected in buckets to water trees and kitchen waste was converted to compost. So these are the practices which are so much propagated and promoted in contemporary times. But see that Gandhi and his followers actually made use of these practices 
or followed these practices over, you know, several, several years ago. Once again, to highlight the point that Gandhian environmentalism was something very, very futuristic. Even before it was given a word, even before the term environmentalism became a part of common parlance. Very importantly, vegetarianism was not just a practice, but also an article of faith in Gandhian thinking. Gandhi firmly believed that vegetarianism contained both practical as well as ethical, religious and medical values. It also reflected the fact that human supremacy over the so-called lower animals did not mean that we should prey upon these animals. It does not mean that we should treat these animals as things for our consumption, but rather that there should be a symbiotic and a mutual relationship of aid between all animal life as well as human life. So herein lies a very, very important lesson that animals or the animal kingdom should not be considered lesser or lower and therefore something to be exploited, something to be treated in the most barbaric way possible, but rather there should be a love and a respect for all life forms, which will then only enhance the humanity of the human species. The settlers in Tolstoy farm ate homegrown vegetables and fruits. So there was a complete rejection, as we've mentioned, of non-vegetarianism. And even though these satyagrahis came from very diverse backgrounds, we find that they ate together. Home-baked bread was made from coarse wheat flour and the bran was always retained in it to increase its nutritive value. They made homemade groundnut butter and marmalade. There was also the practice of drinking what was called wheaten coffee, which was made out of roasted and powdered wheat grains, and which was really a substitute for beverages such as tea, coffee and cocoa, which as you know, are all products of commercial agriculture. Clothing was also a very, very important lifestyle. So the importance of khadi as a political tool we are all very familiar with. Khadi became a kind of emblem of resistance against British imperialism. At the same time, if you look at ashram life, you find that khadi becomes a sustainable and locally produced material, which is ideal for climatic conditions in tropical countries. And as you also know, Gandhi himself, his own dress, was a loincloth and a simple chadar because he wanted to identify himself to the extent possible with the poor, the toiling masses who could not really afford very elaborate clothing. So this was a way in which he tried to immerse himself into the lifestyle and into the lived reality of the people who were his greatest source of strength. Reusing of paper is also a very, very famous habit that Mahatma Gandhi used to practice. And there are stories that are told about how he would use pencils right up to the time the pencil had reduced itself to a tiny stub. In your uh, self-learning instructional material, you will find that there is an interesting anecdote about how Gandhi's pencil stub, the one that he used, could not be found. And everyone in the ashram was looking for it. And they finally provided him another stub, which made him very angry indeed. However, finally the pencil stub that he used was found and he was absolutely delighted with this fact. So this just goes on to show how committed he was in his own personal life to practice what he preached. As we know, one of the articles of faith of Gandhian philosophy is the notion of the self-sufficient village and Gandhi's great emphasis on village industry. His concept of the self-sufficient village which produced enough for its own consumption, also had a very, very important impact or a very, very important implication with regard to conservation of nature. On the other hand, when we consume things that are not locally produced, which are produced in faraway places, and we transport them towards ourselves, we find that there is a resultant need for increased fuel consumption, which results in pollution and cost if we bring goods from far off places to our areas. So the importance of self-sufficiency, of local production, of using locally made goods is of the essence, both in terms of the economy as well as the ecology or the environment.
Gandhi also laid a great deal of emphasis on organic farming. He warned against the environmental perils and the environmental dangers of mechanized farming or highly chemical farming. And his warnings, everything that he said, we find unfortunately coming true in the contemporary times. Some interesting uh, case studies or some interesting examples of his way of using sustainable practices or the kind of sustainable practices that enabled or paved the path towards self-sufficiency. Non-edible oil soap making was very interesting such practice. So Gandhi was aware of the shortage of edible oils and so with the help of the economist and Gandhian J.C. Kumarappa, they found a way to make soap out of non-edible oil. During the season, villagers would gather neem leaves crush them in oil presses, and from the neem oil, they would make different types of soap. As a result, there was also an awareness to grow more trees and plants from which non-edible oils could be produced. Another very important area was that of leather craft and shoemaking. So now, as we know, leather craft is a very, very important village industry. However, Gandhi wanted shoes and leather items to be made from what he called ahinsa leather, that is, from the hides of animals that had died naturally, rather than killing animals for the purpose of acquiring their hides. Similarly, in the area of silk weaving, which uses the cocoons of silkworms, he preferred or he promoted the idea of making silk from cocoons from which the silkworm had turned into moths and then flown away. So even in the use of art and craft forms, which required the use of animals, Gandhi basically promoted non-violent practices, practices that would not harm or injure the animal in any way. As we all know, cow protection was something that Gandhi was deeply committed to because he abhorred cruelty to animals. And this is something which reflects really many of his principles of the unity of human beings with nature, the importance of nonviolence, and the ways of treating nature with kindness, with empathy, so that we would not exploit it, so that we would not destroy the very nature to which we owed our existence. An important point to be borne in mind, as I have repeated time and again in the course of this lecture, environmental consciousness, which really became a very powerful global movement, in the present times was in fact something that Gandhi had preempted years ago. He had spoken about it years ago. Contemporary environmental consciousness urges us to reconsider our relationship with nature. In this context, we may mention Rachel Carson's famous book, Silent Spring, published in 1962, in which she highlighted the impact of pesticides on human health. And this particular book is believed to have sparked off the contemporary environmental movement in the West. We have to bear in mind that human beings have always spoken in terms of conquest of nature in contemporary civilization rather than coexistence with nature, which is something, as we have discussed, was beautifully reflected in ancient Indian civilization. And this, in a sense, has led to the global environmental crisis. The cultivation and expansion of needs is the antithesis of wisdom. It is also the antithesis of freedom and peace, according to Schumacher, a very, very important economist who was deeply influenced by Gandhian thinking. Let us now talk a little bit about some important people who were inspired by Gandhi's ideas, how Gandhi's ideas were given a new shape and a new form in the thinking of some important visionaries like J.C. Kumarappa, like Schumacher, and contemporary Indian environmentalists. Let's start by talking about J.C. Kumarappa. Now, although Gandhi wrote and spoke at length about the ideal way to live, he did not really formulate a very clear economic theory. And the credit goes to one of his closest disciples, J.C. Kumarappa. He's considered one of the pioneers of the ecological movement in India. In his book, Economy of Permanence, A Quest for Social Order Based on Nonviolence, 
he basically founded his ideas on Gandhian principles of truth and non-violence. Kumarappa said, we should never lose sight of that great teacher, Mother Nature. Anything that we may devise, if it is contrary to her ways, she will ruthlessly annihilate sooner or later. Everything in nature seems to follow a cyclic movement. Water from the sea rises as vapour and falls on land in refreshing showers and returns back to the sea again. The water cycle is something that is taught to every school child. However, the wonder, the mystery and the beauty of the water cycle is something that as our environmental consciousness develops will become a source of wonder, a source of great enchantment as well as something that is deeply sobering when we think about how nature has devised ways, how nature has an inherent way of renewing, of sustaining, of keeping the world alive. And I think that this mystery of nature, this great order that prevails in nature, is something that deeply influenced Gandhian thinkers. According to Kumarappa, there were two kinds of material resources. One was the non-renewable type, such as coal, mineral, petroleum, etc., which he termed the reservoir economy. And the other was the kind which could be increased by human effort and hence inexhaustible. And these were resources such as timber, cotton, etc., which he termed the current economy. So basically renewable and non-renewable resources were played an important role in Kumarappa's way of conceptualizing the economy and the ecology. Govindu and Malgan write that in Kumarappa's scheme of things, a reservoir economy is predatory in nature because the society that draws on resources that it has not contributed to in any manner. And this leads to a short-circuiting of the chain of rights and obligations. The current economy, on the other hand, is predicated on societies fulfilling these obligations. So the, nature, so the notion of reservoir and current economy is a very important contribution of J.C. Komarappa, which was based upon Gandhian ideals regarding nature and conservation. Schumacher is considered one of the very, very important thinkers who was deeply influenced by Gandhi and whose work, Small is Beautiful, is one of the very, very important texts which speaks of basically downscaling the economy, basically speaks about how environmental degradation and disaster can be averted by the ruthless path towards growth and development that the world has embarked upon post the Industrial Revolution. So Schumacher was an economist and as I've mentioned was deeply influenced by Gandhi. He likened fossil fuels or the non-renewable resources to natural capital which had been provided by nature and which human beings took for granted. He warned that if we steadfastly insisted on treating this natural capital as expendable, as if it were income, civilization and life itself would be endangered. And if we look at the history of the world in the post-industrial revolution period, we find that this is exactly what is happening. Natural capital or natural resources are treated as things which are never going to come to an end, which human beings can exploit very, very thoughtlessly as if they would never be exhausted, as if they would never end, and as if human life could continue in the same trajectory for the foreseeable future with little care for what the future generations would bear or would have to deal with as a consequence of our own path of greed and our own path of exploitation. To quote Schumacher, as Gandhi said, the poor of the world cannot be helped by mass production, only by production by the masses. The technology of mass production is inherently violent ecologically damaging, self-defeating in terms of non-renewable resources. And of course, the impact that this kind of violent method of production has had 
has been primarily borne by the poor. Even today, we see the global economic crisis or global environmental crisis, which has resulted as a consequence of this path of development, has impacted to the maximum extent the poor and the marginalized on the earth. Sundarlal Bahuguna and the Chipko activists were also profoundly impacted by Gandhi's thinking. The entire Chipko movement, the famous environmental movement of India, which is quoted as a case study in environmental studies departments all over the world, is something that was premised on Gandhian principles of nonviolence. In April 1973, Bahuguna led the peasants of Mandal, a village in the Garhwal Himalayas, and successfully thwarted the felling of trees for commercial use by hugging the trees. Other notable environmental activists influenced by Gandhi are Chandi Prasad Bhatt, who worked on ecological restoration in the Himalayan region, Vandana Shiva, who has launched her Beej Satyagraha to protect biodiversity, and who is a well-renowned eco-feminist. Medha Patkar, who has played a huge role in, in challenging large-scale developmental projects through the environmental movement centered around the Narmada Bachao Andolan. And Ramchandra Guha, the historian who has written extensively on environmentalism as well as on Gandhian thoughts and ideas. To sum up, we can say very categorically that Gandhi stood for simple living, walking on foot where possible, making maximum use of one's own hands and supplementing human labor with animal power and simple machines, which did not become the masters of human beings. Gandhi believed in voluntary reduction of our wants and taking from nature only as much as was absolutely necessary returning the waste back to nature so that the process of recycling and renewal could go on and protect the natural resources. He knew that the natural resources of planet Earth are not inexhaustible, a truth that has been realized by scientists long after his ideas were first presented. Thus, we may conclude that Gandhi was indeed a visionary thinker and practitioner in the area of ecological balance, the protection of environment, and conservation of natural resources, and in comprehending or understanding the importance of simple living and the dignity of labor. And that is why in contemporary times, the Gandhian vision becomes even more relevant. Thank you.